All right, our next talk is from uh, Dr. Kelly Zion and Dr. Purcell's, uh, Dr. Guan's lab as, uh, as well, uh, Greg Watson and Taylor Piskey. Hi, I'm Taylor Piskey. Um, and I'm Greg Watson. Uh, this summer we've been working um, under the mentor of uh, Dr. Kelly Zion, Dr. Purcell, and Dr. Wynn, and we've been studying the mass transport phenomena associated with evaporation. And so when we're referring to evaporation, what we're talking about is we're talking about the phase change from a liquid into a gas, obviously. Um, and so evaporation can be used in many applications. Um, one that I think is really cool is uh, it's called surface patterning. And so what happens is uh, when liquid droplets evaporate, they leave behind a pattern. And uh, these are different patterns um, that different droplets leave behind. Um, but with a good knowledge of how evaporation works and how the processes actually happen. You can manipulate these in order to get uh, different patterns that you want for, say, maybe like a nano circuit or something. Um, and so I think that's really cool. That's not what we're doing, though. Um, what we're doing is we're studying the uh, vapor transport mechanisms associated uh, that control evaporation. And those are uh, diffusion and convection, which I'll talk about more in the next slide. So we have diffusion. And uh, so what diffusion is, is it's this molecular transport um, and it's driven by concentration gradients. And so if you put a, a large um, like mass of gas molecules uh, on one side of the room as uh, visualized here, there's a natural driving force um, of them to move to an area of lower concentration. And so what we'll get is we'll get this moving of these particles into this lower concentration. And so uh, that's what we're referring to when we say diffusion. Um, and so our other transport mechanism is uh, it's called buoyancy induced convection. And um, I'm not sure if this video will work, uh, but it was working earlier. Um, but anyway, you can kind of see a good visual of this video. But um, essentially, uh, convection, when I'm talking about it, I'm saying uh, that it's a bulk transport <coughs> phenomenon, um, which I'll explain it again in a second. And it's driven by density gradients. Um, and the reason that it's driven by density gradients is because of, is because of gravity. And so uh, in this video, we have this red fluid, which is a heavier fluid than this green fluid. And uh, as it progresses, we can see this uh, red fluid flowing down into this green fluid because of gravity's pull on it because it's heavier. And so once this red fluid goes down into the green fluid, the green fluid then displaces the red fluid. And then um, I'll show you what it looks like. Um, but then that's what I mean by uh, bulk transport, is that we can see these huge uh, like bulk masses of each fluid um, just kind of flowing together rather than mixing. And so to study evaporation, study all of its processes, we have a bunch of different techniques that we've invented uh, to study them. And so first of all, well, we didn't invent this, but we have gravimetric analysis. And it's essentially our benchmark. And what it allows us to do is, in our case, uh, take an 80 microliter droplet of, say, uh, a hydrocarbon, say, hexane, um, place it on this balance. And what it does is it takes the mass of um, that droplet over the time that it takes to evaporate. And so what we get as a result is we get mass as a function of time. And so we have mass in milligrams and then time in seconds. What we can do is we can fit a line to this and uh, find the slope of that line, and the slope of that line is the evaporation rate. And so, similarly, we have a technique that's called uh, shadow graphing. And so what this does is it, project, it uh, projects a shadow of, a, of an evaporating droplet onto a camera screen, or yeah, so onto a computer screen, I mean. And so what we can do then is we can take the volume of this droplet over the time that it evaporates get a graph really similar to the gravimetric graph, except for that we have uh, volume in microliters over time. Uh, we can take the slope of this, and uh, as long as we have the density, we can then have um, the evaporation rate as well. And so what we wanted to do is uh, isolate variables and be able to control the uh, ambient gas surrounding um, our evaporating species. And so we created this pressure chamber and uh, what it allows us to do is it allows us to change the ambient gas surrounding the droplet. Um, and it also allows us to change the pressure that that gas is at. And so we can control better um, you know, the surroundings of our droplets so we can better isolate our uh, variables. And so 
One more technique I'd like to talk about that we have is it's called uh, Schlarian imaging. And so Schlarian imaging is a uh, very similar to shadow graphing, except for that um, the beam of light that passes into the uh, optical um, into the camera that lets it allows us to see it. Um, we just put a razor blade right, just obstructing it just a little bit. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to see this vapor cloud above the droplet as it evaporates. And so if you look really closely at the intensity of this white light, you can see that towards the, like right over the top of the droplet, it's really high in um, intensity and it's really, really purely white. Um, but as we move towards uh, the extremities of this vapor cloud, it turns into sort of a grayscale. And uh, so that gives us a really qualitative measure of exactly uh, the concentration of vapors above this cloud, but uh, it's not quantitative. And so if we want something quantitative, we can do uh, something called IR spectral analysis. And so um, I'll talk about that more on the next slide, but I want to leave this up so we can have a good um, like indication of what it looks like. And so what that does is it passes an infrared beam through this vapor cloud um, at whatever point we want. And that infrared beam absorbs the amount of, um, say, hexane. Again, if the hexane is evaporating, it absorbs the amount of hexane in that line. So we then get the spectra over the time that it evaporates. And so we can integrate this over the wave numbers um, for methanol. It's uh, 3,200 to 2,500 wave numbers. And uh, we can take these integrated absorbances and plot them against the time that it took it to evaporate all the way. And so what happens is that we get this graph right here. And we have this steady state evaporation rate. And, uh, or steady state vapor distribution, I'm sorry. And so it's right above on the top of this graph where it's really flat. And so what we do then is we fit a straight line to that. And so what that allows us to do is extrapolate back to find the steady state um, integrated absorbance. And so what we do with that then is we can pass it through a computer program that uh, does something called computed tomography. And uh, what that does is it allows us to get point concentrations um, in the vapor cloud wherever we desire. And so what we do is uh, we basically do that everywhere in the vapor cloud. So we have point concentrations everywhere in this vapor cloud. And we get these graphs that look like this. And uh, what they are is their concentrations as uh, functions of radial position of the droplet. And so if we look right here, we have uh, z is equal to 1 millimeter. This concentration, uh, these concentrations have been normalized to the uh, saturated concentrations of um, methanol and hexane. Um, and so if we look at methanol at z equals 1, we're right above the droplet. It's my really shaky hand. We're right above the droplet, but uh, we see uh, something that's really close to the saturated concentration, which is what we saw in that uh, qualitative picture of the Schlarian image, um, how it's really intense right here. But then as we move out, um, we move down, and the concentration gets, uh, or we move up, I mean, and the concentration gets lower and lower. And uh, same for as we move outward of the droplet, the concentration gets lower. Um, and now you might be looking at this thinking, OK, well, hexane and methanol have very different behavior. Uh, hexane never reaches the value that methanol does. And uh, it also has different end behavior. It's more curved than this methanol is. Um, and that's something that Taylor can explain more um, in his talk. Yeah. So. Um Craig described uh, a method for us to measure the concentration um, of this vapor cloud at various points above the droplet. Uh, so this diagram that I'm showing you guys is, is a good visualizer of our data set. Right here, we got our, we got our droplet right here, this little bump. Uh, at each of these points, this is a spot where we're going to uh, measure the, uh, the concentration of this vapor cloud. Uh, so we do this all over, and we get a big, big old grid of, of data. Uh, what do we want to do with this data, though? We want to calculate a diffusion rate, uh, as that's our end goal. Uh, so what we do is we take this big data set here. Uh, we use a function in MATLAB called uh, GridFit. It takes the data, <coughs> fits it to a surface. It fits a surface to it so we can model this data. It uses that surface of this entire data set to calculate concentration gradients. Uh, that's uh, DCDR and DCDZ. The change in concentration in the uh, horizontal R direction and the vertical Z direction. What we do with these um, concentration gradients 
is we sum them over a control volume. Here we have in red. It's, uh, we impose this uh, control volume on our data set. We compute the uh, concentration gradients across this uh, surface of it. And then we, uh, we sum those together to find our, the flux through this control volume. The flux is analogous to the diffusion rate. So um, why do we want this diffusion rate? What's the point of that? Uh, we want to compare this diffusion rate here that we've calculated with our method, with our real data, to uh, an evaporation rate that is diffusion limited. Uh, we we uh, calculated with this old uh, tried and true equation uh, that, um, that calculates the evaporation rate only considering diffusion. There's no convection involved. Our data is real data, so it could, uh, in fact, involve both convection and diffusion. Uh, and it was our suspicion that it did. That's why we want to compare these two and see if there's any evidence that our substances are under the influence of convection while uh, evaporating. So we have our big data set. We feed it through uh, grid fit. Grid fit fits it uh, with this surface. This is a fit of our, uh, oh wait, shoot. Um, so uh, before we can actually go through with that and find the diffusion rates, we need to check that our method is uh, correct, that it's working correctly. So uh, what we do is we replace all of this data with analytical data points at each of these points here. We have this thing called the Weber's disk model. It's essentially an equation that will allow us to compute um, the concentration of this vapor cloud uh, as a function of Z and as a function of R. So we fill this up with an analytical data that is diffusion limited uh, by doing that. When we compute um, diffusion rates with this diffusion limited data, we should get with our method that same uh, evaporation rate that we uh, can compute theoretically with that equation. So we uh, compute all that analytical data for a new uh, analytical uh, data set. This is our, uh, this is our uh, model that GridFit makes for us for this, uh, for this data set. Uh, over here you've got concentration on the vertical axis. Here's your Z axis, your R axis, and uh, your droplet is sitting right here on the R axis. Um, and uh, around the droplet uh, you've got high concentration. As you uh, go further from the droplet, the vapor cloud is going to become less concentrated, uh, as you expect. So we take this model and we impose our, uh, our control volume here. Uh, this plot right here, you can think of it as a topographical map. Uh, you've got your, again, your Z on here, your R right here. The uh, droplet is sitting on this R axis right here. You've got your control volume that we've imposed, and these arrows are the, the uh, concentration gradients that we've computed uh, along this control volume. Uh, this theoretical graph here, uh, the gradients that are computed here are uh, computed with the Weber's disk diffusion limited model. So it's an equation. It's the exact, they're the exact gradients. And they don't go through our methodology. Now these, when we add them up, we should get this theoretical evaporation rate, or diffusion rate. And this is the benchmark. This is what we want our methodology to match up with. Um, so we go down to our grid fit plot. Um, this is, uh, these gradients here have been computed using that uh, approximated model from our analytical data set. Uh, so this is our methodology gradients. We sum them up and we get diffusion rates. And that's what we're looking at here in this, uh, in this graph to the right. You got diffusion rates uh, versus changing control volume sizes. So we take a lot of different control volumes and we compute the diffusion rates over those. Um, so here we've got our diffusion rates, which are increasing um, as you increase the size of your, um, your control volume. So what this, uh, what this means, what this means to us, or why this happens more like, is that um, we have sort of a, an issue with the, um, the Weber's disk model has a bit of an issue uh, around the Weber's disk. It's got a boundary uh, condition problem. So uh, these small, smaller control volumes that are very close to this Weber's disk are getting uh, kind of inaccurate um, diffusion rates. Uh, whereas these larger ones are far away from this problem and are getting more accurate um, diffusion rates and they are matching up with that uh, diffusion limited uh, evaporation rate and our diffusion rate and that is, uh, that satisfies us. We're satisfied with our 
so we can move on from there and implement our real data, our uh, experimental concentration data. This here is um, the grid fit model of our uh, experimental concentration data for uh, methanol. It looks very similar. It's a little steeper than our analytic data, but it's uh, very similar. Uh, we impose control volumes of different sizes onto that model uh, and compute diffusion rates, and that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at different diffusion rates over different uh, control volumes. In this plot over here, we've got uh, the control volumes radius is set at seven millimeters. And we're uh, increasing the height uh, from left to right. Over here, we've got a height of a control volume set at 1.5 millimeters. And we're increasing the radius. So uh, let's see how diffusion rate changes over these changes in size. Let's look at methanol, which is in green here. Methanol is remaining relatively constant. Its diffusion rates are. Uh, when you change the height and when you uh, change the, con uh, the radius of this control volume, you're getting relatively constant um, uh, diffusion rates. It's only changing a little bit. And what this suggests to us is that diffusion is dominating the evaporation of methanol. Um, it's remaining very close to this theoretical uh, evaporation rate. Um, and this is in line with uh, what we expected or uh, what we believe because methanol itself is um, its molecular weight is about the same as air. And convection is driven by differences in density between the air and between uh, our substance. And there's very little difference between the density of, of air and our, and our methanol. So uh, convection has little effect on the evaporation and we get consistent uh, diffusion rates that are close to that theoretical. Now let's look at the opposite extreme, which is 3-methylpentane in red here. It's got a very high diffusion rate that changes a lot over changes in uh, control volume. Um, uh, it rockets down when you increase the height of our, uh, of our control volume and it, and it shoots up uh, in diffusion rate when you increase the radius uh, of our control volume. What's, what this suggests to us is that convection is coupling with diffusion uh, and affecting the evaporation of 3-methylpentane uh, here. The same thing for hexane, which is also uh, not in great agreement with the, uh, the theoretical rate, which is uh, this dotted blue line. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in more of a visual uh, context for you guys to, to see why we believe this is suggesting to us that convection is is uh, is affecting the evaporation rates of these things. So uh, we're gonna look at a plot of diffusion versus real data uh, of hexane, which has um, a similar uh, who has the same exact uh, molecular weight as three methyl. Convection should be working on it. Uh, we got our Z in this way, we got our R across here, the axes, and uh, our droplet is sitting on the R right here. And this uh, blue is the vapor cloud. So in the diffusion, you can, you can see that the vapor cloud is allowed to radiate outward into space almost weightlessly and uh, diffuse itself, uh, distribute itself evenly throughout the space. So when you have different control volume sizes, they're all going to have about the same flux of vapor going through them and thus the same diffusion rates. But you go over to the actual data, which, is, uh, which convection is occurring in, and that diffusion model is pancaked, it's smushed down. And uh, the vapors that are trying to escape upward into the air are being pushed outward to the sides and are spilling over the platform of our droplet. Uh, and this is... Uh, this agrees with uh, our last data and uh, our last uh, graph here. As you increase this, the height of your control volume, you're going to get less and less diffusion through that control volume. At one point, you're going to be so high in your control volume, you're not going to get any diffusion at all up here in the upper portion. Whereas when you're increasing the radius, you're going to get more and more of that uh, vapor that should be going up, but instead it is going outside by the force of convection. So that's, that's, that's our thinking behind. Uh, so what have we done here? We've, um, we've come up with a method to uh, calculate, or not calculate, to measure the, um, the concentration of vapors above a, above a droplet using computed tomography and uh, IR analysis. And uh, we've taken that data. We can use GridFit to model it. We can uh, use that model to compute gradients and concentration, and then use those gradients to compute diffusion rates over several control volumes uh, that are accurate, and which we can use to compare. We can compare those uh, diffusion rates. 
um, with real data against diffusion-limited uh, theoretical evaporation rates. And by doing so, we have found that uh, substances like 3-methylpentane and hexane, which are uh, heavier than uh, air, are under the influence of both convection uh, and diffusion uh, uh, in their evaporation processes. So we'd like to thank uh, the Petroleum Research Fund for giving us the money to do this uh, project. Like to, Greg and I would like to thank Dr. KZ and Purcell, Dr. Wynn, for uh, allowing us to do this with them. We really appreciate it. Learned a lot. And uh, we'd like to thank the chemistry department, the engineering department, and mathematics department here at Trinity. Thanks. And for a question or two? So when you do the, the experiment, how do you control the surface area of the drop? Uh, so, OK, yeah, so we have the substrate. And um, it's kind of, it's, uh, it's, so we have a substrate that's made out of um, zinc selenide, and then we have a copper substrate that's raised a little bit above it. And this copper substrate is 13 millimeters across, and so basically it has an edge that um, we, our droplet can like, so it's a bowl. Attach You're to. putting it in a bowl. No, it's it's, oh, it's it's a it's a flat it's a, it's a flat, flat substrate. So how do you keep it? How do you, if if you're reproducing the experiment, how do you get the same shape of the drop? Well, the droplet is pinned at the edges so that it remains in this uh, spherical cap shape uh, every single time. And we then we use the same volume every time. So there's some some constraining device. So, so the liquid goes down and it completely wets the surface, and then when it gets to the edge, it essentially pins itself. And, and due to surface tension, for okay. example. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So yeah. yeah and, then, and then it, and then it, and it's pinned and it stays there, and for a long period of the life of the droplet, the surface area is approximately constant, and, and the droplet just decreases like this. How big is that device? Two centimeter long. How big is that device from your slide? Oh, uh, the substrate. The substrate's thirteen millimeters across. And like it, two centimeters. But we've done studies where we've we've actually buried that also. So what do you mean by vapor concentration to make your maximal hexane this dry? Um, what was that? I'm sorry. What do you mean by vapor concentration? Okay, so it's essentially the um, amount of uh, vapor in that area, and so um, moles per centimeter cube. Yeah. Moles per centimeter. How do you change vapor concentration? Uh, or to, so how do we get vapor concentration? Um, so we take the integrated absorbance, and then once we have the integrated absorbance in that area, um, using um, infrared spectral analysis. Um, then we can take uh, then we can take computed tomography, which uses Beer's law, and uh, transfer, and then it changes those integrated absorbances into concentrations. So you calculate from the spectrum. You don't control the vapor concentration. Right? Oh no, not not in yeah, the, not in the um, not in the IR chamber, but in the pressure chamber. All right, we need to move on to the next talk. Let's thank them again. All right, while we're waiting for it to download, uh, our next talk will uh, also be from the Kelly Zion and Purcell groups, and it will be given by Kristen uh, Runstein and Brenton Mendelhoff. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Runstein. And I'm Brenton Mendelhoff. And um, as uh, we are under the same instruction as Greg and Taylor were. We have study evaporation. We're under the advisor of Dr. Kelly Zion, Dr. Purcell, and Dr. Wynn. And we are studying the evaporation of subsoil droplet in different pressures and ambient gases. So, um, as Greg told you guys a little bit about uh, evaporation, I'll give a brief sort of overview about it. There's um, whenever a droplet evaporates, it creates vapors, and there's two transport mechanisms. There's diffusion, and there's convection. 
So diffusion, it's a molecular transport. So the molecules want to move in a randomized motion, while um, convection, it is a bulk transport. So it takes a mass of the molecules and moves it around. Convection is a density gradient, so it wants to go from the, low, the high to the low density, and convection is a, con yeah, it's a con concentration gradient, so it wants to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. So um, you can see this picture down here, you see this rectangle, that is the substrate, and then this little bump here, that is our droplet. There's these vapors above it, this white cloud. And if it were to be just diffusion, this cloud would be very circular. But convection, it pushes, because it's gravity controlled, these vapors are pushed down, sort of pancake-like. Another two key differences about diffusion and convection is that the diffusion, its equation has been known, it's been studied for decades, while convection, it doesn't have an equation by itself. So um, we, to study these different transport phenomenons in the evaporation rate, we use a technique called shadow graph, shadow graphing. So what we do is we want to see how the, the drop, <coughs> how fast it evaporates under different pre pressures and gases. So we shine a light on it, we collimate the light, we focus the rays down, it shines onto the droplet, it creates a shadow. And that shadow is captured by a camera, a high-speed camera. This here is a, to your bottom right, is a picture of the um, a typical image that you would see while the drop is evaporating. Our substrate, the width that the pedestal is 12 millimeters, and it's about a one millimeter height. So um, once all of the video is captured, we take it through a computer program, and all of these images are processed and the volume is found. So this graph is volume versus time, and as the drop evaporates, the volume decreases. So um, to get the evaporation rate, you can take the slope and multiply it by the density, and it'll give you the evaporation rate. So a little bit about our lab setup. Um, this summer, we've been taking methanol and hexane, and we've been putting them into the pressure chamber, and we've been changing the gas which there's a pressurized gas tank here, and we've been changing the pressure. So it's also, um, the shadow grafting is an optical technique, so this is a stabilized op optical table. We have a light source over here, which is held steady, and then two mirrors that reflect the light and the camera. So the key part about our experiment is this pressure chamber. Um, inside you can see there is a platform and this little bump, let's see if I can even, yeah, right there, that little bump is where we put 80 to 70 microliters of hexane or methanol. Up at the top there's the needle depositor and there is the window that you can see even the lights shining through right now. Um, so Prince going to talk a little bit. So like Kristen said, we, um, we did a lot of experiments with different gases and um, what we, to begin, we did hexane and methanol. We know a lot about hexane. We've studied it a lot. Um, it has similar properties to 3-methylpentane, which we've also studied with um, comparison to molar mass. But we also wanted to study something new, something a little bit different. And so we studied methanol, which has a very different molar mass than hexane. We also noticed that they have different diffusion coefficients. The diffusion coefficient is a rate, it's a time that it takes for a um, fluid to pass through a certain medium. And so, just to give you a base reference, diffusion coefficients for hexane and air, or hexane and methanol and air at one atmosphere are um, very different. And then we look at their vapor pressures, which is also another thermophysical property of the um, liquid. And those are somewhat similar. And we wanted to use two different liquids because we want to look to change the evaporation rate and see the different contributions of diffusion and convection. But we also wanted to change the ambient gas. The um, pressure chamber allows us to do this. And we, have, we decided to test five different gases with all different kinematic viscosities, which is the, um, the fluid resistance due to gravity, 
and the diffusion coefficients, which is basically the same thing. And that also is affected by the ambient gas. But methanol is also very interesting. Because if you look, methanol and air have about the same molar mass. So we wanted to see how that would affect the evaporation rate and the diffusion and convection contribution. We also looked to vary pressures. Pressures um, affect variables in both the diffusion and convection contributions, and we were looking to vary the evaporation rates with different pressures and see if we could find any trends. So here's just kind of a volume versus time graph, and this is hexane evaporating in different gases. And you'll see that the different slopes give different uh, volumes of changes in volume over time. Multiply by that by the density, and you get different evaporation rates. So we were correct that we could change the evaporation rate by changing the different gases. And then we'll look at methanol, and we'll see that, yes, we were able to do the same thing with different pressures. Now, the important thing is the slope here. The slower, <coughs> the um, less steep the slope, the slower the evaporation rate. And so we did this for um, five pressures, five gases, uh, usually typically three trials per condition setting. And we get a chart like this, hexane, and varying pressures and gases. And if you look, this is hexane and helium at one atmosphere, two, three, and all the way down. And as you can see, a general trend, as pressure increases, the evaporation rate decreases. As the molar mass of the gas increases, the evaporation rate decreases. And we see a similar trend with methanol. Helium at one, two, and it follows this trend here. And we go down, and as we get heavier to the gases, we get a smaller evaporation rate. So in the past, we wanted to do something. We needed a way to um, find out the total evaporation rate. We took a simple, um, I'm sorry, we took a simple equation and we split it up. And based on first principles, we were able to use the equation that we know, diffusion and convection, to come up with something that we believed more resembles the evaporation rate. So the simple equation, the equation that we've known for a while is fairly simple. We have the radius, the diffusion coefficient, the molar mass, the vapor pressure, and the counter diffusion term. But we also wanted to figure out what variables really affected convection. And so what we have here is we have the kinematic viscosity, the diffusion coefficient again, and the density difference, which is what we talked about in the last presentation as well as this one. Now, we believe that convection and diffusion have a coupling effect. And we can really see this, and it's very evident in this equation when we see both the diffusion coefficient in the diffusion term for contribution for evaporation and the convection term for evaporation. So um, to find this correlation, we took all of our data points you can see on this graph and we plugged it into the correlation. And as you can see up on the top right hand corner here, we have um, our coefficients now plugged in. These lines here are our correlation graph with our data points. So as you can see, like it follows the general trend. As the pressure increases, the evaporation decreases. As the gas is molar mass increases, the evaporation rate also decreases. But our correlation doesn't match quantitatively. It's a lot of the data points are low. Same cases with methanol, as um, it follows the general trends, but just doesn't match quantitatively. We're hoping in the future to expand upon this correlation and to look further into it. And we're thinking perhaps maybe we're missing something. Now, you guys might have noticed or caught on, now sulfur hexafluoride, it's a very heavy gas compared with krypton. It has twice the more mass than krypton. 
but with helium, it had sulfur hexafluoride had a higher evaporation rate. So we're thinking maybe there's a counter connection going on. So here we have a video of um, sulfur hexafluoride helium evaporating in it. Now this is hexane evaporating in air. Um, this droplet is here, and this is a Schlieren image, and these are the vapors, this black cloud here. So this is what a typical um, Schlieren looks like, but when you look at the sulfur hexafluoride video, you're going to see there's this dip up here, and we're about, to, it's going to become real obvious real soon. It's going to, it's nice and slow, like kind of like watching paint dry, <laughs> but um, you see this dip. It's very unusual. We have never seen this before with the Schlieren. So we think maybe this is counter convection happening, possibly. Um, but anyways, in summary, we have, um, to measure evaporation rates, we have the shadow graph technique. This summer we looked at hexane and methanol, and we, uh, we looked at these two liquids evaporate in helium, air, argon, sulfur, hexafluoride, and krypton. And we looked at them through one atmosphere through six atmospheres. And we saw the general trend that as pressure increases, the evaporation rate decreases, and as the molar mass of the air, as the gas increases, the evaporation rate also decreases. Our model was able to fit the general trends, but it still needs tweaking, and that is something to come in the future. We'd like to thank the Petroleum Research Fund, uh, Trinity University Departments of Chemistry, Engineering, Science, and Mathematics, uh, Dr. Kelly Zion, Purcell, and Wynn, and Nick McDonald, McDonald and Edway of Manny, and Greg Wassel. That is due to the drop settling out. Are you talking at the yeah. beginning? Yeah. No, no, no. Or it's about Just the wiggles here. Yeah. yeah. What, what's, what's the noise? It's basically the, our computer program isn't perfect. So um, there's some variances in between each image. And the drops also aren't perfect. If the pressure chamber is slightly off, sometimes we'll get it'll come in and out of um, our parameters, and the computer program will at times not pick things up. Also, unfortunately, sometimes you can see a little bit of shaking in the video, too. So that might also count. You guys actually, um, uh, the program is actually taking the, the black and the white, and it's digitizing it, and it's calling a pixel either one or zero, yes. right? That's correct. And so um, at any one time, at any one pixel, at the surface, it, it might be one or it might be a zero. Right there, so there's a certain amount of, of, of noise associated right at the, at the surface with, with, with it being a one or a zero. Right. So if you had a better CCP detector, you would be able to refine that more and, drop, and get the noise down? To a degree. Po possibly. possibly. Um, but it's, it's not worth worrying about. No, I, I yeah. yeah, I just want to I just want to get a sense of where that noise is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it comes. I think it really comes from the digitizing of the uh, image. Um, and once you digitize the image, then you've got the surface. Once you have that surface, then you you can rotate that thing cylindrically, 100, 300 degrees, and then that's how you get your volume. So, um, so I think it just comes from the digitizing. Of it. So is that what you do? You actually rotate that. That's correct. Why do you think it's not just a no, single no, point no, of view? No, 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 and then no, no, assuming no. a uh, tank. I see. So you've got it on a rotating mirror. No, 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 no. No. You rotate the mirror. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Put it above your image. The image, um, let's see. This yeah. One. So that's an image. It's, yeah. It's, it's a two dimensional image, right? Um, and then we fit that. And then using the computer, we have the computer rotate that. And that gives us our volumes. We don't. Yeah. We don't All right. So you're, you're, yeah. I mean, yeah. you could. You're essentially just assuming that shape. Yeah. 
it's so well we know it's cylindrical it's cylindrical yeah. symmetry and it's, yeah. it's yeah. radially symmetrical so yeah. we can do that so it doesn't rotate you're just you know the volume sort of yeah yeah, okay. yeah. Exactly. Okay. yeah. Well, we think of that as rotating all right yeah so so your suggestion is what's black and what's white exactly. and the interface becomes problematic and that's what you think the variation is. absolutely yeah and again, sometimes it's better than others. I, I've noticed that um, as we go to higher pressures, um, we see a lot more fluctuation. Um, and then, of course, as we go to higher pressures, especially in like that sulfur hexafluoride, yeah. you get all yeah. kinds yeah. of yeah. yeah of crazy stuff happening in the, in the top. Yeah, here's 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 Krypton too. Yeah. Showing quite a bit of noise. Yeah. You know, it's it's, it's crazy too. Um, they didn't show any of it, but. Um, as you deposit the liquid, sometimes at the very end, the, the, the needle will put a, a bubble. And then this, 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 this bubble kind of screws everything up. It's like a bad run. But it's really kind of cool because your surface area is so much larger there, it looks like a little chimney. And, and, and the, the vapors are just like streaming out of it, like you can out of a chimney. Okay, we will move on. Let's thank them one more time.